Good morning. You guys look very far away from me. Um, it feels weird. Pastor Brian warned me that uh, it feels a little different from this perspective, having the baptismal. So I feel like I, I just want to like preach from here. Um, but I'm not going to because I'm nervous that I would fall in. So um, if you do not know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Pastor Cody. I am one of the pastors here on staff. The man leading us in communion is our campus pastor, Pastor Brian. So you're stuck with me uh, today. We're going to continue on in our sermon series. Okay, let's address the elephant in the room. I'm seeing a lot of concerned faces um, about my hair. I'm not ignorant of it. I think you believe I can't see you. Um, I can, and I feel judged. Um, No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think I look great, and thank you. I get an amen in the back. Yes, Um, regardless of your sympathy applause, uh, my wife likes it. So that's the only opinion that matters. Can I get an amen? Okay, we are going to continue on in our sermon series called Stories, and we're taking the moments with God that we live and share. And last week, Pastor Brian kicked us off, so if you weren't here, please go back and listen. I know next week we have a special guest speaker that you are not going to want to miss. A few people are pretty excited about that. Give it up for McKaylee. Make sure you are here if you're watching online. You can still watch online, but make sure you're here. Um, Also, I'm I'm feeling like I'm half here, half not here. Um, I have a sick baby at home, so my wife is, uh, everything's fine. I mean, it's sick, whatever. We just need to get through life. Uh, But if you want, say a quick prayer uh, for them. Um, But everything's good. But I just feel like I'm kind of here, I'm kind of not. uh, I'm a little torn, but I'm happy. The The half that is here is really happy to be here. Um, but I'm also a little kind of out of sorts because I was challenged this morning to preach from a tablet and an iPad. Um, I said, no, I like preaching from paper. Um, call me old school. Uh, I like to call me right and correct. Um, However, if you see my handy-dandy iPad up here, it's because the printer did not want to print my notes. So whenever you think you've got technology beat, technology comes back with an uppercut. Um, So I have an iPad. We're we're just trying new things out today. Uh, So with all that to be said, uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to get this party started. That's, our, that's where we're going to find our in the vault text. If you just want to skip over, we're really going to be camping out in Jonah chapter 4. But let's start with Ephesians chapter 4. So if you don't mind, if you are willing and able, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 27 says this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. I'm going to read it one more time. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the moments we get to spend together of celebrating communion, celebrating your word, celebrating your promises, celebrating new life. So Lord, would your joy, would your peace, would your excitement fill this room and fill every heart and mind and soul? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. You can be seated. Um, So today, I'm going to be pretty quick because we have a lot going on, Uh, but our big idea for this message, the big idea I want you to walk away with at the end of the day is this, that love makes you look more like Jesus. Anger makes you look more like the world. And you may say, well, Cody, back up a second because Ephesians chapter 4 said, I'm going to get angry. 
So I don't know if you bypass that part, but the Bible says, hey, there's going to be moments and seasons of your life where you just get ticked off, brother, and you're going to get mad, you're going to get angry, and you're not going to like me when I get angry. But the Bible says when you feel that feeling, that emotion, what? Don't sin. So being angry can't inherently be bad. However, being an angry person, I would say, is bad. I think we live in a world right now where anger is dominant, and it is in our face every single day. I had a conversation with a friend uh, a while back, but it has just stayed with me. Um, for It's probably been five years, and we're doing hot takes with each other. And he's, he said, here's my hot take. Why does everything have to be a hot take? Why do I have to either love something to where it becomes my whole personality or I have to hate something to where it becomes my whole personality? Why can't we just exist? Why can't things just be? And I love this idea because I think in our culture today, you either love something, which that means I have to hate this other thing. I either love Starbucks coffee or I hate Starbucks coffee. Yes, this is some amens in the corner. But you're tracking with me, right? People, yeah, people just can't let things breathe and exist and be part of our daily interactions. Instead, we have to take a stance. So if we're going to take a stance, my plea to you this morning is to choose love. Um, Bob Goff has this quote from his book, uh, Everybody Always. He says this, love isn't something you fall into. It's something you become. And so working with the idea of love and anger, if love is something we just don't fall into, sorry, spoiler alert, you don't just fall in love with someone you choose every single day, you are going to love this person for better or worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, I, I'm going to choose love. I'm going to become love. And Jesus says that you want to know how people are going to know you follow me and you're my disciples. It's because of your identification of love. That wherever you go, love is just present. It oozes out of you. It's not something that just happens. It's not just by chance. On the flip side with anger... I do think we fall into anger. I think something can happen in a meeting. Something can be said. You can receive an email or a text message that immediately just kind of sets you off. But if we're not careful and we don't investigate that anger, we don't investigate our hearts, we can become an angry person. And spoiler alert for the rest of my notes, no one likes an angry person. No one. Therefore, when you get angry, don't sin, don't become an angry person, because that way the devil has an opportunity to wreak havoc in your life, is what Ephesians chapter 4 is telling us. So you don't fall into love, you become love, but I think you do fall into anger so that you have the opportunity not to become anger, not to become an angry person person. You guys tracking with me or have I lost half the room? Great. Awesome. Uh, I'll lose the other half in just a second. Um, so Jonah chapter four, what I want to do today is just kind of walk through this passage and let it breathe. This is the last chapter of the book of Jonah. And we, we are all kind of familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale in chapter one, God calls him to Nineveh, but Jonah's like, no deuces, not doing that. Um, I'm going to go to Tarshish, which is one of the harder names to say in the Bible. Um, and I think I did really well saying it. So thank you. Um, and then in chapter, and then one comes and the storm comes, they throw him overboard, which is funny because the guys in the boat are asking for Jonah to pray to God to stop the storm. But instead, Jonah says, kill me instead. Throw me overboard before I pray to God who has called me and set me apart and given me a purpose and identity through him. Just kill me. So what do they do? They throw him overboard. The big fish comes, or a whale, no matter what your theology may be, uh, comes, swallows him. In chapter 2, we see Jonah not really repenting, 
but lamenting that he is by himself and is far from the presence of God and wants God's presence back in his life. So he gets spit out on, onto the shore. He goes to Nineveh, gives one of the worst sermons you've heard in your entire life. And it's a max six, seven words of, hey, God's going to destroy your city. Like it's not even, oh, let me tell you about my friend Jesus. Let me tell you about creator God. It's like, no, in 40 days, God's going to destroy your city. You better repent. And so what happens? The whole city repents. It gets up to executive leadership in their town, and he calls for a citywide fast. Like animals, people, your cousins, you're not allowed to taste food until the city council says we're good to go because we have to repent and get right with God. And this is a remarkable revival that's happening. And you would think this is where the story should end. It's a happy ending. But then we get to chapter 4, because at the end of chapter 3, God relents and decides, I'm not going to destroy the city. Chapter 4 happens. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Okay, a lot of us should be lost immediately. Uh, this is kind of like my slight jab to people like, God's just angry in the Old Testament. Clearly, he's not just angry. He's not an angry God, but he is slow to anger, and he is quick to forgive and quick to be merciful. And so what baffles me, I was talking to Pastor Brian about this, this response from Jonah presents the deep theological question of what? What are you talking about? Like, what, what, what episode did you just watch to where this is your take on it? It's like me going up to Lindsay of like, Lindsay, you are attentive to my needs. You love me. You take great care of our kids. We have a great home. You let me vent about stuff I need to vent to, and you love me anyways, and you are quick to serve people around you. I'm done with this marriage. <laughs> it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Jonah doubles down and says, I would rather die than you be merciful to these people. I would rather have no more life within me than continue on if this is how you're going to respond. So I'm, I'm going to step away from scripture and I, I, I just feel like there's something wrong with Jonah. Like, is, is that too crazy for me to say? There has to be something wrong in his heart to where he became angry. To the point, he says, I would rather die. There's no point in me living on this earth if this is how you love people, if this is how you care for people. By forgiving them, give me a break. I have no purpose. Kill me. So here's my question that, I, I, I've, I've really been wrestling with all week is, does Jonah really love God? Does Jonah really trust that he has a plan for him, a plan to prosper him and, and give him hope and a future? Because he, he immediately says, I'd rather die than keep serving you. I'd rather die than keep serving the people that you have just saved. This scares me. I'm going to be honest this morning. I haven't really studied to the extent I usually do for a sermon uh, with this one because it's, it's really landed a little too close to home for me. And so I've held like this sermon at like an arm's length of like whenever it'd be time to study or write my sermon, like oh, yeah, oh, topically, just like looking at it and just l reviewing my notes because it started revealing things out of me that I did not like. And as a pastor or a preacher, it's really easy 
to come up here and put on the mask, put on the show, come up under the bright lights, open up the Bible and pretend like I've learned all these lessons. I've mastered them. Here's my master class of how to not be an angry person. Um, but I, I struggle with it. And so I, I, I want to encourage you, be vulnerable to the Holy Spirit this morning. You may have a picture of what anger looks like in your world, but I think the Holy Spirit may want to reveal something different about your anger. Let's keep moving. Um, Verse 3, just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Verse (laughs) 4, the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Is this good for your soul? Like, are you happy about that? Are you happy to be mad? Are you happy to be angry? And then Jonah gives him the silent treatment in verse 5. What's he do? He doesn't even respond. He literally gets asked a question, doesn't respond, turns around. Then Jonah went to the east side of the city and made shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. Verse 6. And the Lord God arranged a leafy plant to grow there. And as soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort. And Jonah was very grateful for what? The plant. Thank you, the two people that are reading along with me. (laughs) But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm came, ate through the stem of the plant so that it would wither away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on to Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Here he comes again. Death is certainly better than living like this. What is his deal? What is his deal? Sorry, I'm sorry. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, (laughs) Is it right for you? Like, is this, are you having a good time? Is it good for you? Is it right for you to be angry that the plant died? Like, what, like, let's do some deconstruction of the heart. Like, what's really going on? Why are you so upset about this? Have you ever walked in and someone's just like on some soapbox about the latest Acolyte episode on Disney Plus and you're just like, why are you so mad about this? What is, okay, what's really going on with you right now? Because there's no way on God's green earth you should be this upset about this television show, but here you are. So God's asking Joe, like, okay, what, what's really going on? As if he doesn't know, but for us, it's like, Jonah, what is the, what's your problem, man? And Jonah, <laughs> after being asked the question, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted. I don't know what that word means, but it sounds like he answered. <laughs> and he says what? Even angry enough to die. You call me call me crazy? Jonah in chapter one says, I'd rather die than go see those people come to glory and see Jesus Christ and be saved. We get to chapter four, and already he is like triple down on like, it's better for me to not even exist than to be serving you. Because you're good, because you're merciful, because you're quick to forgive and slow to like all the terrible reasons. So God keeps prodding and keeps poking and saying, okay, I know you're angry, but you have fallen into anger. Now you, verse one says, you have become angry. What's going on? Let's, let's investigate this. So the Lord said in verse 10, You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there? It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, and not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? End of the book. (laughs) It's not even a cliffhanger. It's just like a bummer of an ending. It's like... God kind of finally has enough of Jonah's attitude and says, okay, listen here. You're mad about this little plant. You're so concerned about it. 
why should we not be concerned about all of the people in our lives that are living in spiritual darkness that you don't want to look in the eye because you don't want them to even exist in your life? Should I not care about those people? Should I not want to love those people? Should I not want to get up off of the east side of the city and go back down and see the fruit of God's labor in this city? See what God is really wanting to do? Should I not care more for those people than the comfort in my life? In my opinion, that's what Jonah's mad about. Not just his obedience, but being in the presence of God is making him let go of his comfortability. And it may seem inconvenient. Because he's so mad about a plant that gave him rest for one night. And God says, hey, you're so concerned about a plant that made you comfortable. Why should you not press into my spirit and listen to my voice and go where my light is dim and no one can hear my voice? Should I not care about those? So here's a, here's a few things I want to talk about. Anger. Dr. Meredith Edelin uh, defines anger as an emotion that we feel when something gets in the way of a desired outcome, okay, check with Jonah, or when we believe there's a violation of the way things should be, check. I mean, this is check in my life too. Like, I think I know what's right and what's just and what should be going, and if it doesn't go that way, I get angry. Like when uh, Dylan Gabriel overthrows or underthrows a receiver for the fifth time in a game, uh, that's not how that should go. I get angry. Just lost a chunk of the room. <laughs> when <laughs> this is my last bit. When Sam Presti should have made a trade in before the trade deadline last season, so we could make a championship run, I get angry because that's what should have happened. Not go get Gordon Hayward and do what? Play 11 minutes in the playoffs and then we lose in the second round? Yeah, I'm angry. I've got issues, okay? I told you, like, there's things in me of like, Cody, is it good for you to be angry about this? Yes. Yes, it is because we had a window and we're not promised another one. So I'm still working through some of my problems. I just really believe we live in a world where it is easier for us to say, I'm mad, rather than I'm hurt. Dr. Meredith uh, Edelin goes on in this article to talk about how anger isn't really a product. Anger is usually a mask that we put over what's really going on in our hearts. Whenever we feel defensive or protective about something, when someone said something to us behind closed doors or maybe to our face and we just get angry, most of the time it's not pure anger towards them. It's maybe we feel insecure that that may actually be true about us. And I get instantly protective for myself, my family, my kids, my career, my job. And so then out of vengeance, I get angry. So we fall, we fall into anger, but we don't have to become anger. So whenever those moments happen, uh, Dr. Edelin would say, most of the time, anger is masking fear, frustration, confusion, loneliness. Fill in the blank. It's only the tip of the iceberg. So Jonah, what's going on, man? I know you're angry, but take the mask off. What's really happening? But we are so quick to say, I'm really mad about this. Instead of saying, I'm confused and I'm hurt about this situation. I don't know why you would say something like that about me. I don't, I don't know why I'm in this season. I don't know why I'm going through the things I'm going through. So I bring them to the Lord and we pray and we, we offer it down. And you still get so frustrated and confused and tired. You feel isolated. So let's, let's keep moving. Yeah, I really need to move. <laughs> um, one of my favorite quotes, you're not going to find this in the Bible because it's not in there. Um, but this is from Master Yoda. He says, uh, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. Well, Cody, in Romans chapter 5, Paul says that we should rejoice in our sufferings. Yeah, I think what Master Yoda is saying 
is sometimes our fear and anxiety and hate and anger, we bring suffering upon ourselves as consequences because we're afraid of a conversation, because we're afraid of reconciling with this person. It leads to anger, and it's this weird tension between you and them, even though you know we're supposed to be friends and talking, but there's this like anger of like what you said really hurt me. And then that anger leads to hate. And that root of bitterness is what the Bible would call it, which leads you to creating your own suffering. Not just the sufferings of this world, which is what I think Romans chapter 5 is talking about. When stuff just happens. But our anger and our hate and our fear create our own problems. They create our own roadblocks to hearing the voice of God, hearing the Holy Spirit in our own hearts. So three things I want to talk about anger real quick. Anger is going to isolate you. Anger isolates you. We see, we see Jonah. It's very clear uh, that he decides to isolate himself. He decides to go by himself and not be around people. Uh, but the, the flip side is also true, that no one wants to be around you. I mean, I'd say, hey, well, you raise your hands. Who, who loves angry people? No, no one does. No one likes going to Chili's with the person that can't, like, stop ranting about something. That They always have something to complain about. They always have something to yell about. They always have that my way was right and this person did it wrong. Like, I don't want to eat lunch with you. Like, I want to go home. Like, I, I, I want to escape this conversation. So anger is going to isolate you. The second thing is anger hardens your heart. Anger is going to harden you. In Exodus, we see um, the Bible say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it's not before out of fear and hate and anger that Pharaoh doubled down like Jonah and said, no, I'm not going to let your people go. I'm not going to free the Israelites because this is my kingdom. This is the way I think it should be done. This is the way I want it done. So it's my way or the highway, bub. And then all of a sudden, anger hardens Pharaoh's heart. The third thing and the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is that your anger can be known to you. It's what Dr. Edelin talked about of anger is just a really a mask of what you're really going through. C.S. Lewis says this, I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her name was grief. You see, it's, it's, sometimes it's our grief that we try to mask with anger but we have to be comfortable enough and yet, dare I say, strong enough to be able to sit in our anger and interrogate it and investigate it. It's like the Bible says of taking every thought captive and bringing it in, questioning it of like, why did I respond to this person this way? What did they say to me? Why does that trigger me? Why did, why did that make me like tense up and be defensive? C.S. Yes, Lewis, like for me, whenever I get on someone, It's because I have a hurt inside of me that's not healed. It's because I'm going through something that is still very fresh in my life. And it just triggers me when someone tries to poke me and prod at me because I'm hurting. I'm not mad. I'm hurt. So if you're in this room today, there's hope that maybe you can't figure out. and You've been going to counseling. You've been going to therapy. You've been meeting with Pastor Brian or a pastor or a mentor or your spouse, whoever, and you've been trying to identify what is it within me that I just can't kick? Why do I get so mad about this? What is it that I am masking? And the good news of the gospel is you don't have to rely on man to give you the answer. Psalm 139 says this in verse 23, God, search me. Look in my heart, know my heart, test it, know my thoughts, and see, just tell me, where are the wicked ways of my life? And lead me in an everlasting way. David finally says, who is an angry person, if you want to read your Bible. uh, We have plenty of angry people in the Bible, so there's hope for us. But he says, God, I can't figure it out. Tell me. Tell me where I'm hurt. Tell me where I'm frustrated. Tell me where I can grow. Tell me why I keep bleeding and I don't know why. Tell me, would you show me, reveal it to me so that I can be closer to you, so that I can hear your voice more clearly, so that I can follow in your son, Jesus Christ's footsteps, in the model and example and demonstration of his love because I don't want to become an angry person. I want to become love. 
I want when people see me walk in a room, they know they can open up. They know they'll be accepted. They know they'll find grace. They know that they will see the face of Jesus. Not because I'm awesome, but because his power through me heals my hurting heart so that I can love others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that no matter what we're going through, no matter where we're hurting, no matter what may just make us so mad, when everyone else may have given up on us and made us lonely, you are still good to follow after us, to ask us back into the fold. So Lord, we thank you in these moments that you are still slow to anger, that you are still steadfast in love and mercy and full of grace. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in this room this morning and you would say, Pastor Cody, I get so angry sometimes and I don't yell or scream, but something in me just like tightens up. And you would say, I want God to reveal that not that I'm mad, but where the hurt is in my heart that only he can heal. I don't want to be an angry person person. If you're in this room today and you say, I don't want to be an angry person. I want God to search my heart and show me. Would you just raise your hand real quick? Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. I'm just going to make a general prayer. Our prayer team will be up here and we're going to sing some songs in worship because We serve a great God who is quick to forgive and love you. So, but if you're in here today, I'm going to, I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Our prayer team will be up here. If you need prayer about anything, please come down for prayer. And the rest of us will stand and we'll worship God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that even when we're mad, even when we're angry, you love us and you are still willing to work with us. So Lord, I pray this over every single person in this room and specifically the ones that raise their hands all over this room that I don't want to be an angry person and I want the Holy Spirit to reveal the hurt in my heart. God, would you reveal it today? It may not be fixed or fully healed today, but God, we know the assignment and we know your goodness. So Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. You guys can stand and worship and pray with us. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a beautiful name beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hurt you, the veil took
What an awesome message that was from Pastor Cody. Hey, if you're still praying, continue to pray. But if you don't mind just having a seat for like a few more minutes, we're going to get to baptize somebody today. And we're going to baptize her. And when we do, man, we're just going to erupt and celebrate. So go ahead and have a seat. I want to invite uh, Pastor Maggie and Josh, our kids pastors, to go ahead and come on up here. One of the things that we get to do at our church that I love is that our pastors all share this or parents or whoever. This is a moment. So Sienna is right here. Uh, Pastor Maggie, do you have anything you want to say or share right quick? Pastor Josh is going to pray here in a second. But what's going to happen is we're going to baptize Sienna, all right? Uh, they've already talked to her. They prayed uh, with her, and we know that she loves Jesus in her heart. Her parents are right here. Thank you, Clark and Lisa uh, and family that are here. What an awesome uh, privilege it is today. So you guys ready? All right, let's go do this. Give it up for the Lord. Stand again with us this morning. What an awesome moment. Man, God's been good to us today. If today's been the first time you've been with us, thanks for being a guest with us today. I want to invite you to stop by our starting point right back there. See Cambrian. She's an amazing human being. We have a gift for you we would love to give you. Uh, there's a communication card right in front of you. Fill out the part of that that allows us to get in touch with you this week because what's going to happen is I'm going to call you and say, hey, you should come back here. We love you. Uh, and then also, if this is your weekend to tithe or give an offering, uh, you want to do that through the offering boxes or through the app, okay? Uh, oh, update. Um, our, um, all of the things that you've seen us update, the screens and the lobby and all the things, just so you know the generosity of this house um, has given more than we've spent. So thank you guys for doing that. Uh, we covered ourselves in that. And then also we're going to be talking in a few weeks about Fire Bible and some other mission stuff. But it's going to be exciting. I love you guys. Cannot wait. Next week, you do not want to miss as we continue our series on stories. God bless you. Have a great week. And we will see you next Sunday. <laughs>